Okay, we should get started. So today we have uh, Dorea El Ashray, who is coming to us from Miami, and I'm actually uh, I'm the T32 director, um, Carol Lang, and we have uh, usually have a guest from the postdocs of the T32 and a guest from the pre-docs of the T32, and so today is the postdoctoral guest. So I'm going to actually have one of our T32 trainees, Chelsea Lassiter, Dr. Chelsea Lassiter, introduce Dorea, but I just wanted to say. Thank you for coming, and DeRay is an old friend. We go way back to the Colorado group, and um, it's I'm just delighted to have her here. And so without further ado, I'll let Chelsea do the honors. Thank you. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, as Carol said, my name is Chelsea Lassiner, and I'm a postdoc in uh, Kaylee Schwartfiger's lab. And I want to uh, welcome Dr. Dorea El Ashray here today. She's currently an associate professor in the University of um, Miami, the Department of Internal Medicine at the Miller School of Medicine. Dr. El Ashray graduated from Vanderbilt University with a bachelor's in molecular biology and a minor in chemistry. She obtained her PhD, uh, as Carol said, at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center under Dr. Dean P. Edwards, where she studied cellular and molecular properties of progesterone receptors in breast cancer. She then went on to the Lombardi Cancer Center um, at Georgetown in DC. She was awarded a Komen postdoctoral fellowship where she studied estrogen regulation of TGF alpha in breast cancer. And after finishing this work, she began working as a research instructor at Georgetown University. Uh, she became an assistant professor in the Department of Oncology um, at the Lombardi Cancer Center. She then moved to the University of Michigan Health System in Ann Arbor as an assistant professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology until she uh, then moved to uh, the University of Miami, Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, uh, Brahmin Family Breast Cancer as an associate professor. And today she's going to talk with us about circulating cancer associated fibroblasts and breast cancer metastasis. So welcome, Dr. Elashri. Much, Kaylee, and um, thank you to the T32 program and Carol for inviting me here to speak. Um, it's a great pleasure to come here. I've never been to Minnesota, but I know a couple people here, and so it's great to come and see them and meet new people and talk to them. Um, so this morning I'm going to tell you about um, our work um, on circulating cancer-associated fibroblasts, and um, I'll give an introduction about cancer-associated fibroblasts in general and then how we actually found that they actually circulate with cancer cells. So um, what's depicted in this slide is um, what I was just describing to you, um, is the cancer cell in pink um, surrounded by all of these cells that um, normally reside in that environment. And um, these cells all play important roles, whether they're, um, uh, whether they're endothelial cells involved in angiogenesis or in certain cancer types like breast cancer um, and um, uh, ovarian cancer and colon cancer, whether they're adipocytes and play um, important roles in that, um, whether they're immune cells and immune repertoire cells, tumor suppressive or tumor um, in, uh, enhancing. Um, and then here, this cell right here, the fibroblast and the cancer-associated fibroblast is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So the microenvironment of the uh, normal breast um, is quite is, is pretty quiet. I mean, there are other cell types there. Clearly, there's res uh, resident uh, quiescent fibroblasts. There's some um, immune cells that are there. But um, the normal breast has a, what we would call a quiet microenvironment. But as early as DCIS, um, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, this is all changing with increases in uh, fibroblast uh, populations, increases in uh, immune cell repertoire in, uh, uh, populations, and increasing in uh, endothelial cells. And this continues to progress um, and sorry, progress and change um, to invasive ductal carcinoma and then to um, uh, metastasis. And in fact, at metastatic niches, you find um, a lot of the tumor microenvironment cells that were um, at the primary site, you find them um, at the metastatic niche. And clearly, this is perhaps one of the ways that um, cancer cells, when they get to their inhospitable new environment, can uh, start to grow and proliferate there. So cancer-associated fibroblasts are fibroblasts in the tumor microenvironment that have an activated phenotype. 
Um, and so they don't look exactly like a resident uh, uh, quiescent fibroblast. They have this uh, activated phenotype. And by activated, it means that they do a whole lot more of what a normal fibroblast would do. So they secrete even more um, extracellular matrix constituents. They secrete more growth factors, cytokines, and chemokines. And they have um, an increased proliferative capacity. And by that, I don't mean that they grow faster, but that they can grow for longer than a fibroblast. So whereas a normal fibroblast maybe can be passaged for maybe five or six passages, um, these cancer-associated fibroblasts have this expanded lifespan um, well into the 30s or 40s um, in terms of that, if you uh, think of it that way. Um, the majority of uh, stromal cells in uh, breast cancer are CAPS, um, and uh, a couple other cancers have uh, a very high both stromogenic component and the fact that the CAFs are the preponderance of that. Um, lung cancer is another one. Um, and they're identified based on their expression of specific proteins. Some of these are, are fibroblast proteins like fermentin and alpha smooth muscle actin. But CAFs then have uh, expression of this very specific protein to them, which is fibroblast activation protein 1 or FAP. And CAFs can arise two ways. So um, there's a preponderance of the field that thinks that um, resident fibroblasts within the tumor microenvironment are activated to this phenotype by the cancer cell. But also there's very clear evidence that mesenchymal stem cells recruited from the bone marrow by specific cytokines that the cancer cell uh, gives out then arrive at the tumor microenvironment, are activated to this phenotype, and play important roles. So how do CAFs differ from quiescent normal fibroblasts and importantly, the wound healing activated fibroblasts. So again, uh, the field has um, been for a while that uh, CAFs are also found in wound healing aspects, and that's because uh, wound healing activates fibroblasts to a very similar phenotype. But with recent work, um, it's now seen that there can be differences between those. So a normal quiescent um, resting uh, fibroblast can be activated by a wound to this wound healing activated phenotype. You can see that um, uh, changes occur in the fibroblast, both um, in its uh, phenotypic morphology as well as in all of the things that um, it now secretes, including extracellular matrix components, and some <coughs> growth factors and cytokines and chemokines. But one key facet of this activation by wound healing is that this is a reversible step. Uh, once the stimulus of the wound has gone away because it's been healed, these uh, cells revert back to a quiescent uh, resting phenotype. On the other hand, when uh, the fibroblast or mesenchymal stem cell is activated to this cancer-associated uh, phenotype, um, you see very similar features to this wound healing activated, extracellular matrix components, growth factors, and chemokines. Now you see the, the expression of FAP comes up, and it's not seen in these wound healing uh, activated fibroblasts. And these um, represent epigenetic uh, and irreversible changes to this cancer-associated fibroblast activated phenotype. So um, these cells will not revert back to a normal resting fibroblast or to a mesenchymal stem cell. Um, whatever these changes are, these are now permanent. And so in fact, you can take uh, CAFs out of the breast cancer um, environment and propagate them in culture, and they retain all of the calf features as you propagate them in culture. Um, and so calves are actually um, involved in all of the hallmarks of cancer. Um, they play roles in um, proliferation and uh, inhibition of apoptosis and uh, drug resistance, and that's uh, including both chemotherapeutic drug resistance as well as in breast cancer. They can induce uh, resistance to hormonal therapies. Um, angiogenesis, uh, stemness and metabolism, and the invasion and motility and, and metastasis. And so CAFs play these uh, very important roles, and they do that by um, secreting a number of cytokines and growth factors um, and chemokines. And this is a very busy slide, but it's really just to give you the overview of the uh, uh, many roles that CAFs play in talking not only to the cancer cells, in inducing these phenotypes, but talking to other cells of the tumor microenvironment. And in fact, um, an interesting paper from about uh, four or five years ago where they used a DNA vaccine against FAP to deplete CAFs within the tumor microenvironment in a 4T1 syngeneic breast cancer mouse model. They found that when they just depleted the CAFs, they not only inhibited metastasis, which is what they were expecting, but they completely changed the whole tumor microenvironment. They um, found that there was decreased angiogenesis and lymphogenesis. 
decreased, um, uh, expre uh, decreased presence of myelo-derived suppressor cells and Tregs, which are the tumor-enhancing uh, immune cell repertoire, and then increased cytotoxic T cells there. Um, and they found decreases in pro-inflammatory cytokines and increases in anti-inflammatory um, and tumorigenic cytokines. So there's this idea then that through these secretions of growth factors and chemokines and cytokines, um, that, that the CAFs are not only directing what cancer cells can do, but are directing the whole tumor microenvironment in some sense. Um, and finally, there's an, been appreciation in the last uh, couple years that not only are CAFs secreting these uh, proteins that we've been looking at for a long time, the chemokines and cytokines and growth factors, but they're also secreting uh, microRNAs. And in fact, um, all the cells of the tumor microenvironment, including cancer cells, are secreting microRNAs in, in their exosomes. And um, many of these uh, CAF-associated um, uh, microRNAs we uh, have seen are secreted by um, the CAF lines that we've generated that I'll talk about in a minute. And, um, and many of them are actually MAP kinase-regulated microRNAs, which is how I sort of funneled into this uh, work of moving away from the cancer-centric uh, focus to uh, looking at CAFs. So we generated a series of models um, in our lab. Um, many of these were generated when I was at Michigan. Uh, they have a tissue procurement core run through the pathology department there. That's actually a very nice uh, feature. It makes it very easy to get uh, tissue um, after uh, uh, surgery from the patients. The pathology takes the piece that they need to do, and then they have a list of investigators and uh, knowing what they should receive, and you leave tubes with whatever you want your specimen put in there. And then they call you and say, we've got a ER negative breast cancer for you, or we have an ER positive breast cancer for you. So um, I generated a series of uh, breast cancer cell lines from primary tumors. Um, this was one of our goals because many of the established breast cancer cell lines come from um, metastases or at the very least pleural effusions. And so they've already sort of taken that first step in getting out. And so we wanted to generate uh, primary models that were more reflective of primary uh, breast cancer, but could be propagated um, in vitro in the lab. And so we did. We generated a series of um, ER negative breast cancer cell lines. Um, those are all published on, and I've given them out to people, and I'm happy to give them out uh, to people when they need a more primary model and can't get the PDXs or they want to alter and do biochemical assays with the, the cells and culture. Uh, but then we also made a series of uh, calf lines from these primary breast cancers. And um, what we found um, and published on recently is that um, the CAFs that you can make from luminal breast cancers are very different from the CAFs made from HER2 or basal breast cancers. And they differ quite specifically in what they secrete. Um, and that's both chemokines and cytokines, but also in these uh, microRNAs, um, and that specific MAP kinase microRNA profile that we uh, had generated. And um, so, in fact, what they secrete um, drives the behavior of the breast cancer cells. So the CAFs that come from basal breast cancers secrete things that actually support and drive the kind of aggressive behavior of basal breast cancers, whereas what luminal, what CAFs from luminal breast cancers secrete supports the sort of luminal behavior of breast cancers. And so we've sort of then tagged them with the names um, indolent or aggressive just to be able to distinguish them. Um, and then uh, DT28 is one of these primary lines that I described to you that we established that is a basal uh, subtype and is uh, highly uh, tumorigenic and metastatic in NAD skid and NSG mouse models. And then we also use MDA231s as another um, aggressive cell line and then MCF7 as an indolent. So we had, as I said, um, found in vitro that the CAFs from luminal breast cancers and uh, basal or aggressive breast cancers differed significantly in their secretome and the effects of that secretome on, for example, MCF7 breast cancer cells. And we uh, published that series of work in vitro. But here, just to show that those differences are maintained in vivo, I'll show you just this one experiment. So here what we did is we took um, either the indolent CAFs or the aggressive CAFs and co-injected them into the mammary fat pad of NSG mice with either the DT28 um, already metastatic breast cancer cell line, although at a far lower number so that we would have a window of opportunity to see an effect of the CAFs co-injected versus alone, um, or with MCF7 cells. And what's shown here um, on these graphs is the um, tumor incidence or the percent um, that are tumor-free um, versus uh, time. And so what you can see for both um, DT, the DT28 breast cancer cell line and for MCF7s is that um, the presence of CAFs enhances tumor formation or decreases latency of tumor formation. But for the aggressive 
already metastatic uh, DC28 line, only the uh, aggressive casts really significantly enhance um, the, the tumor formation and decrease the latency of, of tumor incidence. Um, whereas for MCF7s, the indolent cast can, just the presence of having some cast there already helps MCF7s, um, although the aggressive cast, this is so light, I can hardly see it, but the orangey line, the aggressive cast um, really uh, decreased the latency of tumor formation of MCF7s. Um, but interestingly, even though the indolent cast um, uh, could help MCF7s, uh, for MCF7s, only the presence of the aggressive cast uh, resulted in metastasis of these MCF7s. So MCF7s uh, in the mammary fat pad of NSG mice don't metastasize. And in fact, uh, we didn't see any metastases for MCF7s, and MCF7s with the indolent cast, even though they grew quicker and bigger, um, did not produce any metastases. But the aggressive cast uh, produced ovarian metastases and lymph node metastases, uh, as well as to the spleen. And um, again, with these DT28s and the window of time that we were able to do this experiment because we'd used a much lower number of DT28s for the injection, we could see again that the aggressive cast um, resulted in metastasis, whereas the indolent cast uh, did not, um, and neither did um, no addition of cast within this uh, time frame. And these were to the liver and the lung and the, and the lymph nodes for these guys. So um, these sort of aggressive and indolent behaviors of the cast that come from those same subtype cancers is maintained not only in vitro, but um, with in vivo differences. So um, we'd like to know generally the role that casts are playing in breast cancer metastasis, and that's a sort of overarching field. And so metastasis, though, ultimately, um, after many uh, events and steps, is the culmination of a cancer cell being able to get into the circulation and become a circulating tumor cell, and then that circulating tumor cell being able to go to a metastatic niche and um, establish itself and uh, proliferate there as a metastasis. So on our uh, floor, uh, which is a breast cancer floor, uh, one quarter of the floor is occupied by the chair of pathology's lab. And uh, he has a very active program in circulating tumor cells um, and prostate. And he and uh, his colleagues had established um, this microfluidic filter that they used for capturing circulating tumor cells and being able to enumerate them. And they uh, have published on this filter and have done a lot of work on using this as a mechanism for uh, evaluating CTCs. Um, so one of the differences between this filter and this technology compared to what's out there commercially, um, and for example, in breast cancer bed cell search, is that those other technologies are selective. So they use an EPCAM antibody, or it could be cytokeratin, but cell search is EPCAM, um, and pull out the tumor cell, and they look at those and count them, but anything else that was there is gotten rid of. On this filter, which is a size-based filter, um, small cells like blood cells will go through it. Any bigger cell like a cancer cell or even a lymphocyte will stick to the filter. And then they stain using CAM cytokeratin for the cancer cell and um, CD45 for the lymphocytes. So what they could see is every time they were looking at these under the microscope, is there were cells stuck on that filter that were not staining for either of those two markers. And so we got to talking um, since uh, we were doing this work on casts and we said, hmm, what if those are potentially um, circulating uh, calves? And a paper had just come out um, showing that there were circulating tumor-associated macrophages um, along with cancer cells. So we did a series of work with our calf lines using them through the filter and to optimize uh, staining and uh, the ability to actually capture them on the filter and the retention efficiency and all those things and demonstrated that, um, in fact, from the blood of cancer patients, you can get circulating FAP positive, cytokeratin negative, CD45 negative, um, cancer-associated fibroblasts. So what you see here on the top are just a couple examples, um, with the red staining being for FAP, uh, FAP positive, cytokeratin negative, and CD45 negative cells um, in the blood. Um, we did do a double uh, stain of these, uh, of these cells where we looked for co-expression of the FAP and for alpha smooth muscle action. So here's alpha smooth muscle action and then the FAP to show that they're uh, positive for both. And this is actually thought to be one of the most specific markers of CAFs is, is co-expression of alpha smooth muscle actin and FAP. And then we uh, 
could take the cells off the filter. Um, they're not particularly happy, but we could take the cells off the filter and put them um, on culture plates. And now you see that they have the very uh, mesenchymal um, fibroblastic uh, morphology of uh, calves. So then what we did is used a small series of um, cancer patient blood that they had. And they had already looked at um, CTCs in and looked at both CTCs and the circulating calves. And first, we uh, took a series of healthy donors that you see over here on the far right. Um, not unsurprisingly, they don't have uh, any circulating tumor cells, nor do they have any circulating calves. That's good. Um, then these uh, colorectal patients with metastases, um, uh, the majority of them have CTCs, and the majority of them have circulating calves. Um, these uh, small uh, set here of localized prostate cancer patients um, don't really have CTCs and don't really have CCAFs. Um, not sure what this uh, presence of one uh, might mean. Um, certainly for CTCs, there's been a substantial body of work that's been done on trying to figure out what number is significant, what number might be prognostic of poor outcome, and so there's, there's a cutoff of five. Um, we don't know yet what the cutoff of circulating calves are. And so whether this one is meaningful or whether, again, you need to have some number of them. So then um, what we did is I piggybacked on a uh, trial that uh, Mark Lippman had running of, uh, in breast cancer where he was getting the blood from breast cancer patients looking for MDSCs and specific cytokine profiles. And so we piggybacked onto that and, and just added that we would look at CTCs and CCAFs um, in this patient population. And so this patient population was 40 uh, breast cancer patients who had stage four metastatic breast cancer, and 40 patients who'd had stage one breast cancer that was treated, and they were recurrence-free for at least five years. So so-called cured population, and that's because they set this up wanting to look at the sort of two extremes. So we, we did that as well and uh, asked what we could see here. So um, the first thing is that if you look at the CTCs, um, while the stage four metastatic breast cancer patients had um, significantly more CTCs and more patients had them, uh, what was kind of surprising is that these stage one patients who were so-called cured also had low numbers of CTCs. They are lower, but most of the patients had them. Again, what that might be meaningful for, we don't know at this point. But what you can see is that um, while the stage four patients, uh, almost all of them had circulating calves, um, and some of them quite high, that um, very few um, I think it was only two out of the 15 of these um, uh, so-called pure patients had any. And in that case, they were two or they were three. And they were not, um, they were definitely less than five and they were not any uh, significant number. So um, at least in this patient population, the presence of circulating calf much more significantly associates with metastasis than does CTCs. So in order to get a handle on some of these questions, such as might there be a lower uh, limit um, cut off for circulating calf number, as well as um, do we see circulating calves when you don't have overt metastases? We um, uh, expanded that trial to now have 100 patients of every stage. And so we've been, uh, we did that about seven months ago. It was approved. And so we've been um, collecting patients um, of every stage. And so what you can see here is that. Um, uh, again, unsurprisingly, uh, CTC number um, goes up as you get, as you increase in stage. Um, but circulating calves are found in every stage of breast cancer, um, and they also go up as you um, progress in stage as well. But um, I'll just show you the difference in the scale here, um, so that we had to cut off the scale. So these, you do have more circulating calves than you have CTCs, um, and a number of these in stage one are, um, are below five, whereas a number of those same patients have circulating calves. Whether that's meaningful is sort of the purpose of this expansion. So what we're really interested in here are these stage two and stage three patients um, that um, don't have overt metastases yet, but at a high risk of, of getting metastasis. So about 30% of the stage threes um, might um, have metastases in three years. And so we're following these up to see then if these are prognostic or predictive of poor outcome and whether CCAS alone or some combined CCAS CTC measure. So I will say that um, most patients have both CCAS and CTCs, but there are a number of patients that don't have CTCs and, but yet have CCAS. 
and then a very small number that have CPTs that don't have uh, CCAFs. And so um, I'll show you on this next slide just so you can see, for example, that this patient here is not this patient here with the high uh, CPTs. So now um, this is the same data, except I've added in the small number of DCIS patients that we've um, obtained. And what's really interesting here is that um, the DCIS patients don't really have CPTs, but um, a couple of them have um, good measurable numbers of CCAFs. And this particular patient here in, with the black triangle, um, since we took this blood sample um, about six months ago, has progressed to have um, stage two uh, breast cancer. Um, the, this black triangle up here in the stage fours is, is a patient, sorry, in the CCAFs, that black triangle at the top um, is a patient that um, has since died. And um, that patient is this patient down here uh, with the CPC. So the, the high CCAFs are not the same patient as the high CPC patient. And the patient that died did have CPCs but had this very high number of CCAFs. And so, so far, even though the numbers are very small, what we can see, and the, and the time is very short, most of these patients have been um, with a follow-up of six months or less um, since we've started collecting their blood, that um, those patients who have died did have uh, circulating calves. OK, so what we want to do, really, though, is model what these circulating calves are doing um, uh, to enhance metastasis. Um, we feel that they are playing an important role, as calves do in the tumor microenvironment, that the calves in circulation are playing an important role in either facilitating or um, driving metastasis, in that they would either prepare or go along with the cancer cell to the metastatic niche and um, uh, help them set up the metastasis. So what we've done uh, to start looking at the role of CCAFs um, in mice is um, develop ways of looking at both the CAFs and the cancer cells simultaneously. And so here what I'm showing you is um, where we've labeled the breast cancer cells with firefly luciferase and the CAFs with a gassia luciferase. So the gassia luciferase is um, a thousand times more sensitive than firefly. It uses a different uh, substrate, lamprazine, and you IV, uh, tail vein IV inject that and it has flash kinetics. So within a minute, it's up to its maximum, and within 10 minutes, it's completely gone. So you do the uh, Gassia luciferase protection on one day, and then the next day, do your firefly luciferase. And what you can see here is you don't get um, crossover of that. So uh, what I show you here is the ability to see both calves and breast cancer cells with this method. So uh, over here are representative um, NSG mice not injected with any cell. So there are uh, controls for that. Um, the next um, lane over are um, mice that were injected with only the firefly labeled, uh, firefly luciferase labeled MCF7s. So you see no Gaussian signal, um, and um, you see the uh, breast cancer cell signal down here. Um, and then the next set of representative of mice that were co-injected in the mammary fat pad with the calves labeled with the Gaussia and the breast cancer cells with the firefly luciferase. So here you see the calf signal uh, with the Gaussia and the firefly luciferase signal here. Um, and so this was great. We were very happy that we could do this. And uh, we were thought we could then use these to follow the calves. But as the tumor grew bigger and bigger, we had a harder time seeing the calves with the Gaussia. So it turns out that while well, Gaussia is great because it's got this thousand-fold um, uh, more sensitivity, it also um, has uh, significant issues with tissue penetration. And so you get blunting of your signal um, as the tumor grows. Um, and, um, and, and so that was not working very well for us. So we decided then to see if we could do the flip, uh, label the uh, calves with the firefly luciferase, um, since it seemed certainly plenty sensitive and it's very stable, um, and then label the breast cancer cells with something else. So here um, we have um, a series of mice where we did just that, co-injected the calves labeled with firefly luciferase with uh, the DT28 breast cancer cells. And you can see that at four days after injection, um, in mice injected only with the calves, you can pick up the signal. And in those um, co-injected with the calves and the breast cancer cells, you can pick up the firefly signal for the calves. 
Um, you can see this at two weeks, and you can still see this at four weeks. Um, what's interesting here is that the calves injected alone, um, you can see um, they remain, and then they slowly diminish. And by about five to six weeks, you no longer see that signal for the calves injected alone. The calves injected with the breast cancer cells, we can see out um, to about seven or eight weeks. And then that signal slowly diminishes. Um, so what we did then is we took blood uh, from these mice at various time points to look for, for some of these features. So what you see here is um, uh, where we took blood from that mouse at two weeks, co-injected with the calves and the breast cancer cells, and put it through the filter. And um, you can see that it, then as early as two weeks, we get not only circulating tumor cells and circulating calves, but we get these um, very nice clusters of admixed calves um, and uh, CCTs. So up here is the merged uh, image of the cytokeratin and the FAP. Um, our FAP antibody is a human-specific FAP antibody, so when we're looking here, we're looking at the human calves that we co-injected. Uh, we also have uh, an antibody to firefly luciferase, since these are labeled with firefly luciferase and confirm that they are firefly luciferase positive. Um, so what you see here is the merge signal, and then because some of the brightness of the cytokeratin in the clusters um, eclipses some of the pink color from the calves, I'm just showing you the FAP alone staining here just so you can see that there are calves embedded um, and buried within this clus cluster of admixed cancer cells and uh, calves in the circulation of these mice at two weeks. We then let this experiment go um, to its conclusion where we had metastases in mice, um, so eight weeks. Um, and, um, oh, so I just want to point out that this is um, uh, very uh, significant that we found these circulating clusters in the mouse model because in our patients, uh, samples, we also find circulating uh, clusters, circulating clusters, clusters of CCTs in calves, um, calves with uh, lymphocytes, uh, CCTs with uh, lymphocytes, calves with calves. So we find all manner of circulating clusters in patients um, and a significant number of CTC, CCAF clusters um, in patients or combinations even with lymphocytes in there. So the fact then that we saw these in the mice and could see them as early as two weeks um, was significant. Um, so then at the end of this experiment at eight weeks, um, we now see that um, the mice co-injected with the calves um, and the breast cancer cells have huge numbers of these large clusters of admixed calf, C calves and uh, CTCs. And if you'll remember, I told you about the mouse that we injected with the calves alone and that that signal diminished over time and more rapidly, obviously, than if the cancer cells were there. And so we thought, well, those, C, those, C calf, those calves don't have anything to really interact with. They'll sit there, propagate for a while, and then maybe just go away. But at eight weeks, and we didn't find many, and we didn't think to look earlier because <laughs> we didn't think that they were going to be in the circulation, at eight weeks we could find small numbers of these human cir calves circulating in these mice, suggesting that the calves don't just sit there, but that they actually have the potential to get out in the circulation. And so the experiment we have going now um, is we're taking blood um, at four days and then uh, weekly to see um, when the first time we can detect circulating calves. Do they precede the CTCs? Do they come out with the CTCs? Do they come out as clusters or do they clustering in the blood? So we have another experiment going where we've uh, generated the primary tumor in the mammary fat pad and then we're going to IV <laughs> Uh, tail vein inject the calves to see then do you have clusters only when you put the calves in circulation or are they somehow clustering as they're, as they're coming out. So we have a whole series of mouse experiments ongoing right now with serial blood draws to kind of uh, get at these questions of the first time you can see the calves in circulation and their um, uh, proximity in terms of time to the CTCs. And um, it's not surprising actually that we could see this, the calves even alone in the circulation. They are actually highly motile um, cells and um, have invasive properties. So, uh, but it suggests that calves, the calves coming out of the primary tumor might be the driver of CTCs coming out. And so then if you think back to um, our MCF7 experiment where we co-injected either the indolent calves or the aggressive calves and 
um, that uh, we only saw metastases when we used the aggressive CAS. So that raises a couple questions. So um, do only the aggressive CAS and the MCF7 form clusters um, and the indolent CAS don't? Do only the aggressive CAS get out? So these were the aggressive CAS, for example, that in this experiment. Uh, we have an experiment going on now where we have the indolent CAS alone to see uh, whether they get out or not. So to get at this clustering question, we, um, we uh, generated this uh, in vitro model to look at uh, clustering. And so we used low attachment plates to kind of simulate the um, circulation aspect of these cells being in circulation and no longer um, either attached to each other or to a substrate. And we um, put um, either calves or bre and breast cancer cells um, together and let them go for 48 hours, so a very short uh, time span, and then monitored the cluster formation that we see uh, by putting them on the, through the filters. And so what you see here are um, uh, clusters formed when we mix uh, the aggressive breast cancer with the aggressive CAS, with the HER2 also aggressive CAS, or with the indolent CAS, um, or MCF7. And what you can see is that um, DC28 is able to form admixed co-clusters uh, with any of the CAS subtypes. So it doesn't seem to be that the indolent CAS are not capable of cluster formation or admixed cluster formation. Um, on the other hand, the MCF7s make their own clusters. The CAS make their own clusters. They can even be in proximity to each other. But we have never been able to see admixed clusters of MCF7s with any of the CAS lines. And so one possibility, of course, is that um, the, top, the DC28s are a primary line, MCF7s are established. Maybe that has something to do with the difference. So we um, also did um, this same experiment with MDH231s. Oh, and this is, a, this is a problem with going from MAC to uh, CFEC, and I tried to fix it, and it clearly doesn't work. But for whatever reason, it shifts over the image, and you're only getting the little <laughs> edge, of the, edge of the cluster here. But what you can see is that um, we do get the same admixed co-clusters with MDA231s that we see with DC28s um, and that we are not seeing with MCF7. So it doesn't seem to be a primary versus um, established um, breast cancer issue. Um, so one of the things we were wondering then is, well, OK, if it's not a CAF-centric uh, um, or CAF-autonomous mechanism um, and it seems to be the breast cancer, uh, what could be different uh, between them? And so while we were trying to think about how to go about this, this paper came out where they uh, knocked out CD44 in mesenchymal stem cells, which have very high levels of CD44, and that um, abolished the ability of CAS to be recruited to, uh, it abolished the ability of those mesenchymal stem cells to be recruited to the primary uh, tumor and be activated to a CAF phenotype. So um, our CAFs uh, express very high levels of CD44, and um, certainly there's a whole um, literature on CD44 in stemness and breast cancer, and the DC28s and the MDA231s have a high preponderance, over 90% of them with CD4 positivity, CD44 positivity, whereas MCF7s, as we all know, are only maybe 1% to 2% CD4 positive. So we redid this cluster formation just to see whether um, CD44 might be, um, we could implicate it in any way. And so what you see here on now is the same staining of the clusters, but now we've added in staining for CD44 as well. Um, so beta-keratin for the cancer cell, the FAP for the, for the CAF, and now the CD44 is in yellow. And so what you can see is, again, with uh, 231s and the and CAF23s, we get these um, uh, admixed co-clusters, and they have both um, CD44 positive uh, CAFs within them as well as CD44 positive uh, breast cancer cells within them. And this is the 231s with the indolent CAFs, and you see the same thing. Very nice uh, admixed co-cluster formation. And again, um, the CAFs are CD44 positive, and the cancer cells are CD4 positive that are interacting in these uh, co-clusters. When we go to the MCF7s, we again get these um, uh, again get these separate clusters of either CAFs or um, MCF7s, um, and the CAFs are CD44 positive, but the MCF7s are not CD44 positive with the clusters. 
So um, what we have ongoing now is um, an experiment where we've uh, flow sorted CD44 positive MCF7 cells and put them in the cluster uh, experiment, and I don't have the details of that yet, as well as um, enriching for CD44 positivity uh, through a mammosphere uh, selection and try to um, enhance the number of CD44 positive MCF7s and then put them back in this short-term clustering um, experiment and see if that plays a role. And then we'd obviously pursue um, uh, a role for CD44 in that. Um, Max Wisha has shown that the circulating tumor cells um, that they see in their patients um, are also CD44 positive. So he's proposing that um, the circulating tumor cells that are in clusters and that are associated with metastasis aren't just any circulating tumor cell but are cancer stem cells. And so clearly one of the things we also need to do is go back to our mouse models and ask are the clusters um, ha containing CD44 positive um, cells. So then we think that um, when you have uh, the primary tumor that it's not just CTCs that get into the circulation or cancer stem cells that get into the circulation, but that it's um, tumor cells in conjunction with their tumor microenvironment, um, and in particular CAFs, but also immune cells and um, uh, macrophages that then uh, travel through the circulation and then take up residence at a metastatic niche. And that this is one of the key mechanisms by which uh, circulating tumor cells are able to go to a new um, organ and set up uh, metastasis. And certainly a um, support for this uh, came out uh, two or three years ago where a group used um, a HER2 positive breast cancer model in mouse um, and generated brain metastases and showed that they had uh, CAFs associated with those brain metastases and they couldn't really have come from any resident um, brain or, or neuronal cell that was there. Um, so this idea then that uh, tumor cells aren't just going in circulation, but and not even that they're clustering together, because of course there's all the data from mouse that it's um, CTC clusters that's important for metastasis, uh, but it's not even that they're clustering together, it's that they're clusters of CTCs with their tumor microenvironment components that are then driving metastasis. So um, the conclusions and implications of this are then that um, primary CAFs from um, the breast cancers subtypes, whether they're indolent or aggressive, not only retain these features for in vitro behavior, but for in vivo behavior, and that there really are then, uh, not every calf is a calf is a calf in terms of its behavior, but at least in breast cancer where we have these different molecular subtypes that exhibit such also differing clinical behavior that they, that they have um, uh, association with that. Um, Ellen Pure, um, who works on uh, calves a lot in, um, in, um, in lung cancer, um, had just uh, made a series of casts from different subtype breast cancer and so did gene expression analysis and showed that by gene expression analysis, they also differed by uh, subtype. Um, so there's more data suggesting that the casts aren't just the same um, in terms of their behavior. Um, importantly, casts circulate along with CTCs in cancer patients, uh, both individually but in clusters, um, and the presence of CCAS is more significantly associated with uh, presence of disease and metastasis in CTCs. Um, um, in this expanded trial that I told you about where we have 100 patients, we can see CCAS in all stages, uh, but that they increase um, as stage increases and, and uh, disease increases, uh, and that the presence of CCAS so far in these very small numbers seems to associate with um, progression. Um, CCAS along with CTCs can appear in the circulation um, in as little as two weeks of mice co-injected with them again, both individually and in clusters. Um, and um, uh, we've uh, we're now got experiments to see just exactly how early um, they appear and whether they appear with the cancer cells or before them, um, and whether um, uh, indolent calves can also appear in the circulation and do they uh, appear in clusters um, in the circulation. And then the admixed cluster formation appears to be a breast cancer um, intrinsic uh, phenomenon as opposed to a calf. Um, intrinsic phenomenon, and again, we need to confirm this in vivo um, and uh, pursue the, continue to pursue the role of CD44 both in the calf and in the breast cancer cell, and whether, therefore, then the uh, clusters that we see are, C, are CCAF um, cancer stem cell clusters, and that those then are important for metastasis. So uh, just to acknowledge people who did the work, um, 
But Dev, um, Sharma is a graduate student in the lab. He's done all of the um, labeling and the animal experiments with the calves and the breast cancer cells. And Phil Miller was a uh, previous graduate student in my lab who generated the MAP kinase microRNA signature. And he um, is now a postdoc in Mark Whitman's lab and has uh, collaborated with us and with, uh, with Dev on all those animal experiments. Um, Leah started the uh, uh, enumeration of CTCs and CCAFs in patients. Uh, but now it's currently uh, Kelsey and Pedro who do that. Um, and Kelsey has did all of the uh, filtering of the clusters and the staining of the clusters uh, for those cluster experiments. Um, we obviously uh, collaborate a lot with uh, Mark Whitman's lab. Uh, Richard Cote and Ram Dattar are collaborators uh, for the uh, microfluidic filter. Um, and uh, they have a company that's now making uh, that microfluidic filter and the whole system in a nice little machine so that you can I'll do it automated. When we first were starting this, you were pushing your sample through the filter by hand. Um, and so that's, that's very nice. It's really uh, sped up the ability to do that. Um, and with that, I'll say um, thank you and take any questions. Just a minute till I get you in with the mic. You showed very nicely about the, the load of caps uh, on breast cancer tumor operation. My question is, have you thought about targeting approach? For example, if you have you characterized those cells from patient with breast cancer so that you are able to target, you know, uh, calves so that especially it may be helpful, you know, it may be good for a patient with early stage breast cancer. So have you thought about this approach? So, um, so not only have we thought about it, but um, uh, quite a lot of people have thought about targeting CAFs um, over the last uh, few years. And initially, it was a um, SAP enzyme inhibitor, because SAP is a dipeptidyl proteopeptidase um, that sits on the surface of the cells. And originally, it was thought to just be a marker of CAFs. But more recent data suggests that it actually plays a role in CAFness, because if you knock out SAP, then the CAFs don't uh, have the same ability to generate uh, changes in cancer cells. So um, people used an enzyme inhibitor of SAP, but, uh, and it, it had nice in vitro and even in mouse model um, effects, but in a uh, clinical trial, it uh, showed no e efficacy. And um, uh, SAP has a very close family member in that dipeptidyl protease family, and so the inhibitor was not um, only specific for SAP. So then the next um, round of attempts to target it was with a humanized antibody. Um, and so that was, uh, again, in vitro and in mouse models showed very nice efficacy, but in a um, metastatic colon cancer population uh, clinical trial, um, it didn't show um, any efficacy. So um, more recently, uh, or most recently, um, Ellen Puree working with uh, her team there, they have um, CAR T cells um, uh, now that are generated mm -hmm. against uh, SAP. And again, in vitro and in vivo, um, they're working, uh, in mouse models, they're working very nicely. And so I think they're taking them to clinical trial. Um, we have a collaboration um, with a company that, um, with which then we've generated uh, FAP um, targeting antibody drug conjugates with the idea that um, for other ABCs that have been used um, and that are very effective in the clinic, that you get a significant uh, potentiation over the naked antibody alone by having it with the antibody drug conjugate. And so um, we've uh, worked with them with our calf lines then to generate um, these FAP ABCs and they target calves very nicely. And so we'll be moving those into mouse models um, in the near future. But yes, there are a lot of people very interested in um, trying to target FAP for therapeutic use. So. Um if I understood right, you implied C44 might be involved in the calf cancer cell interaction. And um, so there's a, a company that's interested in targeting hyaluronic acid in tumors to improve chemo or immunotherapies, including in breast cancer, for those that are HA rich and CD44 can be a receptor for HA. So I'm curious to know what, whether you, you know, what ligands you think for CD44 are involved in this interaction and whether disrupting hyaluronic acid, you know, what, what, what might the effect be on this phenomenon that you've seen of circulating cohorts of cells? Right, so um, all of this clustering data is exceedingly, exceedingly new and we're just getting it. And 
the looking at the role of CD44 um, is literally uh, like a month a month old. So um, CD44 is expressed heavily in, in mesenchymal stem cells, and the calves retain that. Um, it's obviously a stemness factor, but it's also an adhesion uh, molecule and receptor for HA. So, um, and there is a known role for HA in breast cancer. So clearly that would be a place we'd be very interested in going, especially if the um, enrichment of CD44 positive MCF7s that we're doing right now does show that now they can cluster with the, with the CD44 positive calves. I think that would then really push us toward focusing on a, on a major role for CD44, and then we'd be very interested in trying to figure out is it HA and is it, could we use antagonists of CD44 um, to, to block that? So uh, early on you showed some data about CAPS being present at all stages of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And that, that's all diagnostic specimen or, is, or at the time of diagnosis before therapy, is that correct? No. So it's, it's, these are all comers. Oh. So this initial trial, when it was opened with the idea that um, especially for Mark and what his purposes of looking at MDSCs and um, cytokines and all that. They just wanted to get blood of stage four and then these, these so-called cured stage ones and look at that. And then we opened it up. So these are all comers. So we have looked um, at um, whether there is any effect of chemotherapy, um, whether patients had chemotherapy or not. So um, in fact, is that showing up? So right here, um, for so of the 400 total that we want to ultimately accrue, we have maybe about 110, um, and those are those are displayed here. Um, so what you can see is that there doesn't appear to be any um, effect of whether patients had chemotherapy or did not um, on whether we see the circulating caps or not. Uh, whereas there does, again, numbers are very small, so it's hard to really say if whether this might be for the CTCs, whether that might be. Although it would be interesting to have matched pre and post, you know. For yes. Say. But I, I guess, you know, the reason I bring that up is what you just said about the clinical trials. It mm -hmm. has no efficacy. And I imagine the role of a FAP inhibitor or antibodies would be, have very different efficacy whether you use it like to prevent relapse versus, you know, at a time when you're maybe overwhelmed with, you know, tons of tumor at relapse. Right, although I think that uh, the real goal of people who are <laughs> going after CAFs is, I mean, this is all very new that we find them in the circulation. So I think the real goal is to get them at the primary site and at the metastatic niche, not necessarily to block these in circulation. So um, all breast cancers have CAFs at their primary tumor site interacting with the primary tumor. And, mo and most of the time you can find CAFs then at the metastatic site as well around that tumor. So I, I really think the goal of people to inhibit CAFs is much more um, not in circulation, but, well, I but guess at, at the site of metastasis or at um, the primary tumor site. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to get at is I'm thinking after you, know, you, you, you take the tumor out, you throw it away, you give adjuvant therapy, and then you just watch. And I'm wondering if, you know, if presence or a certain amount of FAPs at that point, you know, could predict progression or not somewhere down the line. And if you inhibit them there, do, you know, would you inhibit setting up these metastases? metastases you know right. what I mean? So um, I, that's, I suppose, and so that's why I'm imagining if you use it earlier before clinically evident metastases, would right. it prevent? So, so we have um, that's going through the IRB right now, um, a trial for um, stage two and stage three patients getting neoadjuvant therapy to take it before, take it after they've finished their neoadjuvant therapy, and then um, um, uh, six months later, and then at time of relapse. And also, so two points. See if it can predict a path CR, that, that these go down, and that, that'll predict a path CR. Um, and then see if um, something about their presence or, or lack of decrease after um, adjuvant chemotherapy can, can pr predict for recurrence. So then maybe that'll get at that. Um. Doria, this is a beautiful set of work. So, you know, luminal A doesn't form PDXs, and, and it might be that they don't have the CD44 positive calves. Have you looked back at the primary tumors for luminal A 
say versus luminal B versus triple negative to see if their caps always lack CD44 or anything like that yet? So we haven't done that. Um, so all breast cancers have caps. So if you, if you just do FAP staining through a series of, um, you know, on the primary tumor for a series of breast cancers, you see caps in all of them. Um, and I think all caps have CD44. I don't think that's, so that certainly hasn't distinguished the, the different caps we have. So I do think that it might have to do with the breast cancer as opposed to the, the caps. And then I do think that one of the reasons that um, luminal A's are luminal A's is because of the way they educate the calf, the, the sure. cells that they recruit, and they make those calves to support that behavior. So just as an example, the aggressive calves secrete um, microRNAs and growth factors that are known to repress ER, right? So if you right. stick them on MCF7 cells, you act, you take the exosomes out, you activate MAP kinase, you induce EMT, you get rid of ER, and you do all that. If you take the exosomes from the luminal breast cancer cells, they don't do any of that. Right. Um, and, you know, in fact, you show that they didn't have the microRNAs to target ER. Um, they had different microRNAs that actually target repressors of ER so that you don't get down regulation of ER. So okay. it seems to educate, they seem to educate a very different um, phenotype or maybe even genotype of the calves that are there in terms of what they're secreting. Right, so I guess that maybe the, the reason people can't get those PDXs and luminal A is they need to have the more aggressive calves in order to get them. Right. That might be a good assay. I mean, you're sort of doing that with cell lines, but I guess right. you could but do that, that with primaries. Be, with, uh, right, exactly. Um, yeah, the work on the CD44 is really interesting and um, definitely seems to play a role, but I wondered if you had um, seen a paper recently where they showed that contraction with the N-papyrin and E-papyrin. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and I was just wondering if you um, had thought of like also assessing. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I did see that paper that just came out. <laughs> um, I was darn, but uh, but I also I also do think that there's potentially um, a very interesting with the CD44 only because again of data coming out uh, not only from Max Lisha but but other people that the clusters that they see um, in patients and in mouse models that are more responsible for the uh, metastasis are. Uh, CSC uh, kind of CTCs, not just um, any old CTC. So yeah, we will we will be um, looking at that um, to see if there's an N cat here, any cat here. <laughs> yeah, terrific. Hello. <laughs> terrific talk. Thank, Thank you. you. So two questions. Your clusters. Do they have fibrin in them? In the patients. No, well, anywhere. I mean, in the mice. Oh, in the mice, but, but, but not right, not the in But there's an old literature, right. being old, me, um, <laughs> that talks about fibrin, very old literature in metastasis and how important it is and whether um, essentially reagents that can inhibit coagulation will, in fact, decrease this interaction. Right. That would be one question. So we have not looked for the presence of fibrin. Um, or even platelets. Being, right, you know, and platelets, right. Well, but no, we, so we haven't, and that's a possibility. Yes, exactly. The second question is when you take your MCF7 cells that have been co mixed, mm -hmm. you put them into mice, they become more aggressive when they're co mixed. Mm -hmm. Have you isolated those cells and re injected them without any caps yes. to see whether they're So, so that's, we're, we're, we're doing that now. Okay. Exactly. So, uh, and, um, uh, and yes, those, so those MCF7 cells, at least by staining, are, are different. Than what we put in, so. Take a push. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, Dorea, do you, you might have said this, I just might have missed it. Do you think the caps um, are genetically or epigenetically modified by the cells, or are the cells selecting an existing resident population of kind of more primitive mesenchymal fibroblasts? And then the second part of this, do they come from the breast? You know, because there's a literature that circulating mesenchymal stem cells from the marrow will show up in metastatic deposits. So, um, so to the first question, um, we so our caps we isolated from a primary breast cancer, um, and uh, they have retained their phenotypes from the get go. We um, we use them on under twenty passages, but they will go up into you know, the upper 30s, 40s passages before they even start uh, slowing down. 
Um, that recent, uh, very recent review, there was a new review uh, that came out all about CAF. Um, and um, there is um, evidence that um, unlike wound healing activated fibroblasts, which can look very similar, um, but then completely revert back to a quiescent fibroblast set, uh, CAFs have epigenetic changes that make that a stable and irreversible uh, phenotype. Uh, so I, I do think that's the case. So to the question of resident fibroblasts and mesenchymal stem cells or uh, mesenchymal stem cells, so I favor the uh, recruitment of mesenchymal stem cells by the cancer cell, um, which then come to the primary site and are activated by the cancer cell to that uh, phenotype. There's been a series of studies where they've labeled mesenchymal stem cells, put them in the bone marrow. They can follow them. They go to the primary site. They lose some of their mesenchymal stem cell markers. They gain calf markers, and they look like they've been activated um, uh, to calf. Um, so I do think that, and there's a lot of data with mesenchymal stem cells and putting them with breast cancer cells and showing that they do that. Um, in fact, if you do those experiments and now see that you got enhancement of metastasis, for example, um, those mesenchymal stem cells have lost some of the mesenchymal stem cell markers and gained some calf markers. So I do think that when you see what you're calling circulating mesenchymal stem cells or at metastatic sites that they're calves and and not. We um, did gene expression analysis of our calves with mesenchymal stem cells and with normal mammary fibroblasts. Um, and part of that was just the overall gene expression profiling of all of the um, primary cancer lines we did and all that. And we did that with Chuck Peru. And when he clusters them with all the cancer cells or with tumors, the mesenchymal stem cells, the calves, and the normal mammary fibroblasts all cluster exactly together. But then when you look at them as just that group, um, yeah, there are a lot of similarities to normal mammary fibroblasts, but there's significantly more differences in gene expression between the CAFs and HMFs than there are between CAFs and MSCs. And in fact, there's only a couple hundred gene differences, 200, between <laughs> the CAFs and the MSCs. So certainly the CAFs we made, I think, were a mesenchymal stem cell arriving to the cancer and being activated, and not a lot has to happen to, to that mesenchymal stem cell to give it this activated phenotype because they probably have a lot of those capacities themselves. But certainly one of them is FAP expression, and that was one of the, the differences. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.